This is the San Cristobal area of Cuba, as it is looked from time immemorial. This is how it looked in October 1962. Those are Russian-made, Russian-manned ballistic missiles. Almost the entire population of the Western Hemisphere is within range of their nuclear strike capability. Today, they are gone. The story which you are about to see is the story behind that change, the story of the Cuban crisis. In 1962, the United States and the Soviet Union stand on the verge of direct military confrontation during one week in October. Ever since 1492, October has been an important month for the Americans. October 1962 will prove to be no exception. Columbus Day falls on a Friday. Ten days later, the United States and Russia will stand on the verge of a direct military confrontation over Cuba. It will be the most frightening week the world has known since the end of World War II. But on Columbus Day, the danger is not apparent. In the age of intercontinental missiles, crisis comes with the speed of sound. And so, in October 62, Americans are basking in the Indian summer sun in blissful ignorance. The Yankees are sweating out a seventh game thriller with the San Francisco Giants. The March of Dimes is choosing its annual poster girl. The First Lady is playing hostess to the children of the diplomats of many nations. for the birth of still another new African nation, Uganda. At the Vatican, the princes of the Roman Catholic Church have gathered from around the world for their ecumenical council. Back home, Washington turns out to receive Ahmed Ben Bella, premier of Algeria. Mr. Ben Bella's next stop will be Havana. But Cuba is not in the forefront of most Americans' thoughts during the warm fall days of mid-October 62. Not that the Cold War has been forgotten. We are firing a rocket at the moon. The Russians announced the on-target firing of a 7,500-mile missile. And for more than a year now, the Defense Department has been quietly putting together a massive program to strengthen civil defense. Special training and fallout protection analysis has been given to engineers and architects, and a nationwide shelter survey has been underway, checking every possible building. Banks, stores, municipal buildings, schools, churches, even caves. Community fallout shelter space for more than 100 million people has been located. Supplies for the first 46 million spaces are already in production. Food and water drums, medical and sanitation kits, and radiological monitoring equipment. They're coming off hundreds of assembly lines, and rolling out to Defense Department warehouses all over the country for distribution by local authorities. Building owners across America are contributing space for the new community fallout shelters. And the first shelter signs are beginning to go up. But most Americans aren't paying much attention to civil defense in October 62. The congressional elections are coming up and the campaign shifts into high. I understand what you're up against. And I hope eventually it'll be worked out. In Connecticut, the state headed by Horace Seeley Brown and John Alsup would get my vote. Where I a resident. Mr. Kennedy, too, has been touring the country. But early in October, he has returned to Washington with a cold. And behind the scenes, a major crisis is developing. Its name is Cuba.
the loveliest land that human eyes have beheld. So did Columbus describe the land he thought to be a part of Asia when he discovered Cuba in 1492. Historically, Cuba and the United States had been friends. The monument to the battleship Maine in Havana had stood as a reminder of United States' help in winning Cuba's freedom in the Spanish-American War. But by October 62, that friendship is gone and the monument has been desecrated. Behind this change is the story of the betrayal of the Cuban people. It began when Fidel Castro triumphantly entered Havana in 1959 after six years of revolt against the dictatorship of General Batista. Castro had promised democracy and freedom. And for a time, he had appeared to most Cubans as their liberator. But at the United Nations, it had soon become apparent that Castro had sold out to Premier Khrushchev and the communists. By 1961, this policy had led to a formal break between the United States and Cuba. One year earlier, the Havana airport had resounded to the excitement and confusion attendant on all great occasions of state. The visitor was Soviet Deputy Premier Anastas Mikoyan. He had brought with him a $100 million trade agreement and the promise of Russian equipment and technicians to help get Cuba's economy back on its feet. And soon a stream of ships from the communist nations loaded to the Plimsoll line had steamed for Havana. October draws near, there is an intensification of shipping into Cuba. And disquieting rumors and reports, many from Cuban refugees, are that Khrushchev may be sending more than economic aid. Is he providing Castro with offensive military weapons? We step up our intelligence activities. Reconnaissance of the island and its approaches is increased. If offensive weapons are coming into Cuba, it threatens the security of the entire Western Hemisphere. For Cuba sits almost exactly in the middle of the Americas, astride the Panama Canal. But to act, the president needs not rumors, but facts. On October 14, a recon plane returns with the first hard photographic evidence indicating the presence of Soviet offensive missiles in Cuba. Immediately, increased surveillance is ordered. And even before the new information can be fully assessed, the president orders the leaders of America's armed forces to prepare for any emergency. Strategic Air Command immediately begins dispersing its aircraft. also moves bombers and tankers from Florida bases to make room for tactical aircraft in the southeastern United States, closest to Cuba. Much of the Atlantic fleet is already put to sea for training exercises that are a routine part of fleet's normal operation schedule. Submarines are on station. On October 16, a new command, U.S. Army Forces Atlantic, is created. And major elements of STRAC, Strategic Army Corps, are assigned to this new command. All elements go on advanced alert. begin intensive training exercises to maintain combat readiness. First 
armored division moves out from its home base at Fort Hood, Texas, to Fort Stewart, Georgia. U.S. Army Atlantic Command includes infantry, airborne, armored, and logistical troops. All move or prepare to move to previously assigned positions along the southern Atlantic coast. Command quickly brings its aircraft to an advanced alert. brings greater strength to the air forces deployed within striking distance of Cuba. Within minutes after landing at new bases, tactical air command planes are armed and operational. By October 20th, Tactical Air Command has moved thousands of tons of equipment and aircraft into the southeastern United States, mainly to Florida bases. Tons of air evacuation hospital equipment are flown to Florida and pre-positioned. Army Air Defense Battalions, equipped with surface-to-air missiles, are moved to Florida by rail and air from all across the United States. given to beef up marine forces guarding the Guantanamo naval base on Cuba. The ready marine battalion landing team at sea with the Atlantic fleet is put ashore at Guantanamo. As a final precautionary measure, over 3,000 Navy and Marine wives and children are evacuated from Guantanamo. The vast military deployment causes little notice outside Florida. Although a direct military confrontation may be less than 72 hours away, few civilians are aware of the impending crisis. October 20th, the nation settles down to a weekend of football and tomfoolery. Northwestern meets Ohio State in Saturday's big game. Most of the weekend news seems to come from the West Coast, farthest from Cuba. The Seattle Fair is closing. A Los Angeles florist is selling elephants. As the weekend starts, in a move partly designed to offset counterintelligence about the redeployment, the 
president resumes pre-election touring. The day before, the Soviet foreign minister, Andrei Gromyko, had told Mr. Kennedy that Russia had no offensive weapons in Cuba. Suddenly on Saturday, October 20th, the president cancels his trip and hurries from a rain-swept Chicago back to Washington. The crisis now has reached ahead. All week, reconnaissance planes have been sweeping the island of Cuba. The new intelligence photos are in, and now the evidence is unmistakable. It shows Russian IL-28 Beagle bombers capable of carrying nuclear weapons. And it shows more offensive ballistic missiles being emplaced. These are medium range. These are intermediate range. Both have nuclear strike capabilities. All of the Western Hemisphere, from Hudson Bay to Lima, Peru, is within their range. With the facts now before him, President Kennedy continues to meet with his top advisors and prepares to address the nation. Now begins a period of intensive public guessing. The date is October 22nd. I have directed that the following initial steps be taken immediately. First, to halt this offensive buildup, a strict quarantine on all offensive military equipment under shipment to Cuba is being initiated. All ships of any kind bound for Cuba, from whatever nation or port, will if found to contain cargoes of offensive weapons be turned back. I have directed the continued and increased close surveillance of Cuba and its military buildup. Should these offensive military preparations continue, thus increasing the threat to the hemisphere, further action will be justified. I have directed the armed forces to prepare for any eventuality. Third, it shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launch from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. There follows 24 hours of intensive civilian and diplomatic activity, and the nation lines up behind the president. I'd hate like heck to see us go to war, but if it's necessary to uh prevent a nuclear war, I think uh, the action has to be taken at this time. Well, I think it's uh, high time we uh, stop Russia from having things her own way. We only have a few more months to go on reserves, and I just hope they don't grab me, that's all. I know that some action should be taken, but uh, he's going to have to tread very lightly short of war. I think it's gone beyond the stage of whether or not we support uh, the president or we don't support him. It's way past that. Suddenly, the idea of civil defense no longer seems either useless or foolish. Suddenly, millions of Americans are asking one question. How can I make my family safe? Suddenly, it seems very important to have adequate supplies in every home. In some parts of the country, supermarket shelves are stripped bare. Yet, if the worst had come, most of these second thoughts would have been too late. the nation, local government authorities and civil defense organizations step up the pace of stocking their community fallout shelters with essential supplies. In a world in which no family is beyond the range of nuclear warheads, civil defense cannot be a sometime thing. It is all the time, or it is no defense at all. At the United Nations, Ambassador Stevenson takes America's case to the world. He asks Russia's ambassador, Do you, Ambassador Zorin, deny that the USSR has placed and is placing medium and intermediate range missiles and sites in Cuba? Yes or no? <laughs> you 
will have your answer in due course. I'm prepared to wait for my answer until hell freezes over, if that's your decision. With support pouring in from the free world, President Kennedy signs the quarantine order. At the Pentagon, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara prepares to enforce it. I have taken the necessary steps to deploy our forces to be in a position to make effective the quarantine at 2 p.m. tomorrow, Greenwich time. That will be the equivalent of 10 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. The forces under my command, that is to say under the command of the President, are ordered to interdict, subject to certain instructions contained in the proclamation, the delivery of offensive weapons and associated material to Cuba. Those are the instructions we've been given. Those are the instructions we will carry out. Strategic Air Command B-52 bombers, already on a massive worldwide airborne alert, are now flying 24-hour mission. The round-the-clock missions are made possible by mid-air refueling. Before one B-52 leaves its airborne station, another is airborne to take its place. Air Defense Command interceptors and tactical air command fighter and reconnaissance aircraft join Navy, Marine, and SAC to maintain watch on the 2,000 ships known to be in the Atlantic. certain how many of them are headed for Cuba with cargoes of prohibited weapons. All that is sure is that within 24 hours, a confrontation between the searching forces of the United States and a Soviet vessel heading for Cuba must take place. The world awaits the outcome. October 25th, the Navy intercepts the Soviet tank of Bucharest and allows her to proceed. On Friday, another encounter takes place at sea. A Soviet chartered vessel, the Marukla, is stopped, boarded and inspected, then cleared to proceed to Cuba. Apparently, the Soviet vessels loaded with offensive weapons and prohibited materials are awaiting orders at sea or have turned back. The world breathes a little easier, but the crisis continues. Low-level reconnaissance planes at near treetop level surprise the Cuban anti-aircraft crews, catch them running for their guns, and report that work on the missile sites is still going forward at a feverish pace around the clock. The Kremlin stalls for time. But the White House makes clear that time is running out. All Strategic Air Command bombers not on airborne alert are prepared to take off combat ready within 15 minutes of scramble notice. The maximum force of anti-aircraft missiles is on 5 to 15 minute alert. At headquarters, North American Air Defense Command, everything airborne within hundreds of miles of our borders is brought under intensive surveillance.
Men and women the world over hang on the news. No one can be sure that he and his family will still be alive at this time tomorrow. On Sunday morning, a message reaches the White House from Moscow. Press Secretary Salinger announces that Chairman Khrushchev has agreed to remove the missiles from Cuba and reads Mr. Kennedy's reply to the Soviet Premier. The President already has left the White House to attend services at his church. in October, perhaps the most frightening week the world has ever known, is over. There would be something special to be thankful for when Thanksgiving Day rolled around. War had not come during that fateful one week in October. It might never come, but it might and there could be no letting down. Low-level surveillance over Cuba would verify the fact that missile sites had been dismantled. Soviet ships would be photographed carrying the missiles out of Cuba. There would be no question about the continued vigilance by America's armed forces. If any question remained, it would concern civilian Americans. Would they too remember this fateful week in October?